The U.S. government's response to the coronavirus has been nothing less than catastrophic, including weak, delayed, and incompetent actions by its two main public health agencies, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention and the Food and Drug Administration. Alex Tabarak, a professor of economics at George Mason University and one of the co-founders of the popular blog and online university Marginal Revolution, is an outspoken critic of the government's actions, including the FDA's refusal to allow for home testing of the coronavirus. Reason spoke with him about official responses to past pandemics, what countries are doing things right, and how the government can get a better handle on stopping the spread of coronavirus. Yeah, I would say that the response of both the CDC and the Food and Drug Administration has been a, a failure of historic proportions. Uh, I've always been, you know, skeptical of the uh, FDA, um, but this failure is uh, so extreme um, that it's really uh, remarkable. I mean, even I'm surprised that it's been so bad. Uh, here's the basic issue. Look, China gave us a window of opportunity by locking down Wuhan, by having immense uh, controls, by shutting down their economy. They took these tremendous actions weeks and weeks, months before we did. And that should have sent up a signal flare to everybody in the world. Take this seriously. I mean, I, as an economist, not an epidemiologist, not a microbiologist, I looked at what China was doing to their economy. And I knew this has got to be taken seriously because the Chinese aren't stupid. They're not going to be throwing away trillions of dollars and entirely locking down their economy uh, for something which is, quote, you know, like the flu. I mean, this is a very serious issue. And the whole job of the CDC, the whole reason we have the CDC is precisely to prepare for pandemics like this. And the CDC utterly failed. They first tried to create their own tests instead of adopting the already working WHO test. That delayed uh, testing. Then the FDA compounded that error of the CDC by not allowing private labs and by not allowing state labs to do their own testing. So this was an absolute disaster, which uh, combined with everything else the government wasn't doing uh, has really uh, delayed our response uh, tremendously. What is the role of testing in, in kind of combating and containing the coronavirus? Well, look, this virus is extremely infectious. Uh, that is, uh, each person, if in, ordinary, in the ordinary business of life, will typically transmit it to three or four other people. And so you have a cumulative process like that, right? That within a couple of days, it goes from one person to three people. And then from those three people, each one of them will generated to three other people. So you got nine when if you and so forth and so forth. So these exponential processes grow tremendously quickly. And that's why what looks like nothing today, you know, suddenly is a huge uh, issue and is overwhelming uh, hospitals. Now the other way of putting that is that if you can test and trace, you test that first person, you trace them to the three people whom he transmitted the virus to. OK, then you can stop it. Maybe if you test quickly and you uh, contact trace, then you can stop it in its tracks. But if you don't do that, then very, very quickly, it is completely out of control and is everywhere in the United States. Why? Why did the FDA and, and I guess also the CDC, why did they, um, you know, not waive once, you know, once uh, the coronavirus showed up here? Why didn't they waive their standard operating procedure and say, OK, we, we need to get more tests in place or we need to open up the process to include more people? Yeah, I mean, this is just typical FDA procedure. And like any bureaucracy, um, they're slow to act. Um, I, I do think they should have, of course, acted much, much sooner. But the FDA was doing what they always do. They were following the rules and the regulations which have accumulated over many, many years, okay? And um, those regulations are just, they're, they're slow, they're cumbersome, they're bureaucratic. This is normal standard operating procedure. Now, uh, Trump, of course, is pretty awful. I think, I think you know, Trump's um, 
handling of the crisis has been terrible. But in no way can this all be blamed upon uh, Trump. A lot of this was baked into the completely legal, completely normal procedures of the FDA. Uh, the FDA has, uh, at least as of today, and we're, we're talking on Tuesday, the uh, 24th, they banned or they, they put a stop to at-home testing for coronavirus. Why is that problematic? Yeah, it's ridiculous because, you know, the FDA has been forced. We First, they were forced to allow the private labs uh, tests, which finally they did, and that has increased the number of tests. Then they allowed the states uh, to do their tests, and so that has increased. But yet still their attitude is to clamp down. So a number of companies a month ago started to uh, produce and uh, in just the last week started to uh, sell at-home test kits. Okay. Now these at-home test kits, uh, you're only collecting the sample at home, you know, the swab up your nose, right? And then it's sent off to a... Uh, registered and certified lab. So all of the uh, science is done in a certified lab. And the FDA said uh, today or yesterday that we're not going to allow these uh, at-home tests. And I think that's problematic for several reasons. Now, it may very well be true, we don't know, but it may very well be true that an at-home test uh, is less accurate than when a nurse does the test. You have to stick the swab pretty far up your nose is what I've been told. Okay. Now there's a couple of things. One, some of that can be caught at the lab. So uh, then you can do a test the second time. Second, do we really want nurses uh, doing all of these tests? Uh, at this point in time where nurses are in short supply, I think it's actually a good thing that some people are doing the tests uh, at home. Second, uh, yes, it is true that you might get, you know, a false negative, okay, uh, which means that you think you don't have it and you actually uh, do have it. Uh, now, clearly, that's not good, okay, but it does mean that as your symptoms get worse, well, then you can go to um, medical care, right? In, again, it's not perfect. Uh, you may take some actions which you otherwise wouldn't, Right. But at this point in time, we really need many more tests and we need to draw on the American ingenuity and free enterprise to, uh, ex to, to, to really address this in a decentralized fashion as fast and as quick as possible. Are there any countries that so far, I mean, you mentioned China, uh, China, you know, is an authoritarian regime. They, you know, were, I mean, I've seen videos of people being nailed into their apartments after testing positive for Corona and things like that. Is that the model that we should be following, or are there other countries that have um, uh, contained the virus in a way that is more uh, kind of comports more, or accords more with uh, a kind of liberal democracy? Right. Yeah. Um, China took very strong actions. I don't necessarily think those are the actions we should have taken, you know, three weeks ago. We may now be forced to do what China did. We may not have much of a choice. Um, but some of the other things which have been done, South Korea has been very, very good at testing and tracing. And so what you want to do there is you want to test. As soon as you find a positive test, you find out everyone that person has met with or been with in the last two weeks, and you go and you test them. Okay? Um, and in this way, you kind of clamp down. And they have, despite having a very fast increase in the number of cases, They've bent the curve. Um, in other countries, we, we still don't know, you know, what exactly is is going on everywhere. But Japan is an interesting case. Um, Japan wearing masks is uh, quite common. Uh, people, even in normal times, will uh, you know walk around on the subway uh, with a mask, and uh, that appears to have allowed Japan, at least so far, we don't know. But it appears to have allowed Japan to uh, do very well in this crisis. Uh, and here we got, I think, again, bad information uh, at the beginning. People were told, oh, the masks don't do any good, right? Just reserve them for, you know, the hospital workers. And, of course, the people in the hospitals, they do need uh, masks and they are uh, first priority. Um, but it does appear the masks work. 
Right, and that's by uh, because the uh, the mode of infection seems to be when you vaporize, uh, when you cough, you sneeze, whatever. Um, if you're infected, that goes out and it comes in contact with other people. So you're keeping it in yourself and other people are not getting it. It works both ways. Um, yes, yeah. you are keeping it in. And also, uh, you're not breathing in directly uh, right. if someone sneezes or something like that. And it just prevents you from touching your mouth and right. nose. Yeah. Right. So right. It's a, because it's a, a very, lot of it is uh, picked up on hard surfaces. Yeah. It's a very mechanical kind of uh, uh, prevention technique. You know, one of the other things that you have, uh, you've criticized at Marginal Universe, uh, Marginal Revolution, excuse me, um, uh, is the Defense Productions Act. This has gotten, you know, this is one of those laws that's been on the books for for a long time, but never really gets invoked. Can you describe what it is and why you think it's a, a, a kind of false savior in this situation? Yeah, so the Defense Production Act is, is sort of what you see in the movies, right? Is uh, uh, the trucks are all uh, leaving, they're all running away from the front. And uh, the army comes in and says, we're going to requisition these vehicles to get our troops, you know, where, where they're needed. And in that kind of sense, I think it's fine. Um, and if we needed to build tanks, you know, um, and, you know, it, it was, you know, literally people were invading. And I think it would be fine. Um, but the main issues that we're dealing with right now are ones where the consumers uh, want masks, the consumers want hand sanitizers, uh, consumers and the medical professionals, they want ventilators. So all of the market signals are all working in the direction that we want them to work. And for th this idea that the government can simply come in and go to a factory and say, you know, you're making cars, but now we want you to make ventilators. It just doesn't, doesn't make a lot of sense. Uh, for two reasons. One, the government doesn't necessarily know what actually are the best substitutes in terms of production uh, for the ventilators. What are the, what are the real machines that you need to make the ventilators? The government doesn't also know the secondary consequences. That is, if you take some factory and you turn it from producing, you know, cars or trucks or something, and now it's producing ventilators, well, maybe you needed those trucks to, uh, for ambulances. I don't know, right? But the government doesn't know those secondary consequences. All of that is much better handled by the price system. We let the prices rise. We let entrepreneurs figure out, hey, maybe there's a better way of producing these things. Maybe we can produce them. Um, maybe there's, you know, animal models which uh, can be used. You know, maybe it's not like the truck manufacturers which have the actual technology to produce ventilators. But it's accordion makers. Maybe the accordion mm -hmm. makers really have right. the uh, right technology. Do you um, do you worry yeah. like in the you know in the early days of uh, you know when the coronavirus really hit? And I, I guess you know uh, thinking late February and whatnot, there were runs on things like toilet paper. Uh, obviously, hand sanitizer is in short supply. Do you feel like the productive capacity of the United States is up to kind of providing what we need or do we need, uh, you know, are, are we going to have persistent shortages? No, no, no. The, the productive capacity is there, no question. So already the shelves in most places are uh, either filled or refilling. We're not going to run out of mm -hmm. toilet paper, okay? Right. Don't worry about that. Don't worry about yeah. toilet paper. Um we're not even going to run uh, the, the hand sanitizer that's being taken care of. That'll be uh, uh, filling the shelves again uh, quite uh, quite quickly. We can do all of that stuff um, really uh, quite well. Now, uh, we're already also ramping up on masks and things like that. But again, one of the problems with the Trump administration and with the, uh, the, the trade war with China is that China now actually is a very good place for us to go buy masks because they've got a handle on the disease. They're, they produce millions of them every single day, okay? Ventilators as well. They don't need quite as many as they were producing. So actually the thing to do would be to get on the phone, say, can we get fill up a plane with these things? And that would help with some of our emergencies. So rather than uh, blame the Chinese, you know, we can talk about that some other time. Let's get that, we'll, we'll worry about that when the disaster is over. 
it's very obvious that this disease attacks all human beings. Right? It does not respect borders. And so we need to work together. And the Chinese, they took the first hit. They now have a lot of productive capacity, which we would like to buy from them. And we should be thinking about doing that. What, um, you know, one of the other things that you've written about at Marginal Revolution online, people can find it, uh, you know, if they Google it. Um, you've talked about, uh, you know, some people now are saying that we've been too blunt in locking down all people. Basically, I'm, I'm talking to you from New York City. You're in the Washington, D.C. area. These are two cities that have had a real, you know, substantial lockdown. Non-essential workers are supposed to stay home and either, you know, just get unemployed or work from home. Um, you are not, uh, some people are starting to say, you know what we need to do? This is a disease that strikes mostly older people uh, with underlying health conditions. We should be quarantining them, but we should be letting younger, healthier people go back to work and kind of restart the economy. What is your critique of that? It's too early uh, to do that. Um, there are two problems with segregating the elderly. Uh, the first is that, look, even though the probability of dying is lower if you're young, there's still an awful lot of young people, okay? Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of people less than 65 years of age, including myself, um, whose probability is pretty damn high. OK, uh, given given the background, given background risks, and there's a lot of them. So it still means potentially hundreds of thousands of excess deaths among young people. Moreover, it's going to be very hard to keep the death rate down if the hospitals become overwhelmed. That is what Italy faced, what Italy is facing right now, um, even when you can treat people uh in a normal situation and they might recover when you have got uh when you lack ventilators when you lack beds when you lack physicians when you lack nurses you don't have enough of them okay then the death rate is going to go way up so that's the first problem it would mean a lot of young people dying the second problem is this idea that we can segregate um and isolate the elderly or those most at risk that makes sense when most people don't have and don't get the virus. But if you're talking about segregating and then letting everybody else go back to work, those other people are gonna get the virus and they're gonna give it to their grandparents and they're gonna give it to their um, uh, you know, coworkers and other people that are in the same apartment building and so forth. Um, so it's actually segregating the elderly. It really only works when not that many people uh, get the disease. Uh, so I don't, so I don't think, so, so I think it, so I, so I think the idea is sort of self-contradictory in, in two ways. One, it will kill too many young people. And two, it actually won't work. Uh, segregating the elderly actually won't work that well. What is your sense from a, a kind of economic point of view though? How long can we, you know, how long can we sustain an economy where we're, you know, people are talking about, having a massive shrink, uh, shrinkage of, of the economy, you know, over the next couple of months, um, how long can we go on with a workforce that is essentially idled? Yeah, um, there's no question that uh, it's going to be a very sharp, very sharp uh, decrease in uh, gross domestic product. Uh, and that's going to be very painful. Uh, unemployment is going to be high. Now, what I do think is that if we can get the number of tests uh, up and we can start uh, testing and tracing, which means that you find somebody who is positive and you trace everyone they've, <clears throat> they've come into contact with uh, and test them, then we can uh, start to do two things. One is people who uh, are negative, uh, we can start uh, allowing more of them to meet with one another, okay, right? So you put, I'm negative, you know, we may have to have badges, okay? Um, and those people can start uh, to go back to work. Second, there's a second type of test, which is not whether you have the virus, but whether you had the virus. And that is, that test works by looking to see whether you have antibodies, uh, whether you have the, whether you, the immune system has developed 
uh, some of these antibodies to attack the virus. And if you have the antibodies, that suggests that you have some immunity. So the people who have been infected and who have recovered, uh, they're also going to be great workers because you don't, you're not worried about working with them uh, because they have some uh, uh, immunity. So uh, for both of these reasons, testing and identifying, then we can start getting people back to work. But to you, do that, first we need to first we need to uh, flatten the curve, as you said. What do What do you think? Uh, how long will that take? Uh, you know, under kind of current circumstances or current practices, what are we looking at for uh, before we get uh, to a point where we start opening things up again? Yeah. So <clears throat> it really depends upon how quickly we can ramp up the number of tests. Um, a lot of tests are being developed. Uh, they do seem to be coming online pretty quickly, but it's still far less than I would like. Um, when we have a lot more tests and when we've got New York and San Francisco and Seattle, when we have those cities under control, then I think we can start um, to do some of these things, maybe in a few weeks. Um, that's what I would uh, hope. And I think we can do things like the following. We shouldn't really be having, not for very long, just sort of uh, dividing work into essential and non-essential, right? Instead, what we should be doing is saying things like, you can go back to work if everybody in your work uh, can wear a mask and doesn't interact with the public, right? So there's lots of, you know, uh, uh, firms where they're, you know, in a factory or, or you know, uh, they're building something. You have the workers there. They're not interacting with the public. You know, every worker on an assembly line can wear a mask. Many of them would be wearing masks anyway, right? So those workers should be able to go back. That is, instead of just saying essential versus non-essential, we should say, like, just as we do with food, uh, anybody can open a restaurant so long as they follow the following uh, health uh, conditions. And so anybody should be able to go back to work so long as the workplace can follow the following kind of conditions. Uh, you uh, wrote recently about a, uh, a study of the 1957 Asian flu uh, ep outbreak in, in the United States, which killed between 70,000 to 100,000 Americans. What was what did you find when you looked at this? Because reading your uh, write up of the work on it, it, I mean, it's staggering, really, that this happened, you know, within relative memory and nobody seems to really think about it at all. That's right. Yeah, it's very puzzling because we had in 57 and early 58 a pandemic quite similar to what we're having now. Uh, it was not quite as infectious and the fatality rate uh, for those who got it was not as high. So it's not as dangerous. wasn't as dangerous. But as you say, but you're talking like 100,000 people. I mean, that obviously in the exactly. late 50s, they wouldn't have known World War Two, but that's double what died in the Korean War. Uh, just absolutely. A few years before. Yeah. Uh, absolutely. And uh, there was a big recession <laughs> also, yeah. a very sharp recession. So growth fell by like 10 percent um, in that uh, first quarter. Yeah, I, th I th think you noticed uh, that that uh, it produced or right around them was the worst quarter post World War Two on record. Correct. But then you said that when you looked at people who were talking about that period, none of them even mentioned, like economists, analysts, don't even mention this. Exactly. So I'm, I'm, I was a little puzzled at this because from today's perspective, it seems pretty obvious that yeah. um, the flu would have sent a lot of people home from work and uh, was worldwide, and this recession was worldwide. Um, but nobody uh, at the time kind of thought that it was uh, causing the recession. So I'm actually not sure. Um, I actually think this is a puzzle for economists uh, to look at. Uh, was was the uh, was the recession caused by the pandemic, or was it just coincidental? What, Certainly, um, we did not do all the things we're doing now. You know. Yeah. We did not is close. that? I mean, is that because I, you know I don't want to say life was cheaper then, but it was it just? I mean, was it that the the concept of medical interventions, uh, you know, in a, in a kind of mass way were not as developed or people were willing, you know, again, it's hard to think about this, but, you know, whether it's the 1918 uh, Spanish flu epidemic, uh, you know, the depression, World War II, et cetera, there was just seemed to be a higher tolerance for 
adverse effects. I mean, that are, you know, events that are just terrible. Yeah, I think that's right. I mean, I, I think you're absolutely right. I mean, this was a generation or generations which had gone through uh, Great Depression, World War II, Korean War, and all that kind of stuff. And, um, you know, I think they were more hardened to it. Plus, of course, they had less choice. Um, you know, thank God for the Internet, right? The Internet and the American Internet, right, uh, has held up incredibly well. So this is something I think we all ought to be amazingly proud of. Uh, the American Internet is is uh, conveying much, much more traffic, and it has done so seamlessly. I mean, look at us. I mean, yeah. we are having a conversation across, you know, you're in, you're in L.A., right? I'm, I'm in New York. You're in New so, York. Okay. So only yeah. across, you know, 800 miles yeah. or something like right. that, right? Right. And yet we have full video. And yeah. uh, it has not failed us yet. So the American Internet has been uh, incredible. You know, uh, one of the one of the things that uh, a number of people are observing, uh, and, you, and you're you're part of this. You're building out a kind of cloud based world. Uh, Marginal Revolution University um, has a ton of online courses. You teach online, I guess, both through Marginal uh, Revolution, and uh, you also. Uh, do you do uh, teaching uh, distance learning for George Mason as well? I do. I do. So I. I have to admit um, that the crisis uh, has, uh, I'm less affected um, by many people since I was already teaching online. So yeah. my class actually has continued um, as, just as, as if nothing had happened. Right. Um, so I'm a little embarrassed to, to admit that because it is easy or it is easier for someone like myself who can work from home to say that we should, you know, lock down or keep the lockdown for, for longer. Right. And, um, you know, I'm not, I'm probably not looking at unemployment. So I understand all, all of that, but ultimately the economy is about people, right? And there's no point having high GDP per capita if per capita is really low. <laughs> okay. Right. That's not the way we want high GDP per capita. Yeah. What do you think is the hardest thing? I mean, and obviously, I mean, academics, I think in, in many ways, journalists or many journalists, certainly in my own experience, I've been working from home uh, either full time or part time for almost 25 years at this point. Uh, like you, this is uh, there There are real costs to it. And it, and this is the slow squeeze psychologically. I think it's going to become more and more apparent on people. But day to day, it's not that big a lifestyle uh uh, change for me. What do you think is the hardest thing for regular kind of workers in the meat space economy, you know, where they're face to face every day? What is the hardest thing to kind of get by or to kind of uh, uh, to adjust to in, in the in the current moment? Well, I'm not sure about that exact question, but I will say this. I think one of the things which is so difficult about this is we're dealing with exponential processes. And it's very, very difficult to understand exponential uh, processes. So I think a lot of people are looking around and, and saying, well, why are we doing this? And the reason we're doing this is because it doubles every three days, right? And so I think it's very hard to understand or hard to convey to people the counterfactual. What would the world look like if we did not lock down? And I think that's one reason why we were so slow, because it's just hard to believe that something can grow that quickly. Um, and unfortunately, we all sort of seem to need examples. And even China was not enough of an example. Italy apparently was not enough. People always say, well, that's different. China is different or Italy is right. different or whatever. Well, we it think, does oh, seem it can't happen here. Yeah, I mean, it, and it does seem that we may end up somewhere in between the two. I mean, Italy, uh, even for Europe, and I guess Spain is also experiencing something similar. These are, uh, you know, despite being part of Western Europe or, you know, uh, and, and and familiar to people, uh, Italy has always been a poor country. Uh, it is, you know, so it, it may be that whatever is going on there is not going to be the same here. Do you think, uh, when will we know if the current course of actions are effective enough? At what, at what point can we say, okay, we at least know what's working and what isn't? Uh, yeah. How long will that take? So anything we do today won't show up for another two weeks. So that's why, you know, we've really only been in this, you know, 10 days or so. So I'm expecting, you know, later this week, end of, you know, so next week, um, hopefully we'll bend the curve, you know, and, uh, 
get control of Seattle and San Francisco and uh, New York. New York is now looking like our Lombardy. I hope that's yeah. not true. Um, yeah. But I think if we can get control um, in those in those cities, uh, then we'll know we're doing the right thing. Uh, final question, uh, you know, as a, a good libertarian, I mean, you've been you've been writing from a broadly libertarian perspective your entire professional life, um, you know, uh, early on in this. And of course, because people you know don't want to deal with actual problems, they immediately go for cheap shots. So there was a flurry of articles about how there are no libertarians in a pandemic, et cetera. Um, you know, does this shake the way that you think about the size and scope of government or the way that it should function? Or um, or do you feel like um, this is actually validating? I mean, some of the criticisms you were talking about the FDA, um, you know, uh, wh where do you come out of this from an ideological perspective? Yeah. So let me start with the FDA, because as you've noticed, I've been long been a critic of the FDA saying that they're too risk averse. And, you know, right now, lots of people are agreeing with me, right? because lots of people are finding themselves, oh, I'm at risk. But here's the thing. When you had a deadly disease, it was just a bit as big an emergency, you know, a year ago as everyone is feeling today. So look, put yourself in the other guy's shoes, okay? People ought to be able to do that. So well, if I had cancer, if I had, you know, pancreatic cancer, if I had, you know, some heart disease, I would like the right to try. I would like to have, you know, medicines come out faster, right? And so I think this does very much support me on the uh, FDA. And we have to think about, you know, everything people are saying now, that applied, you know, five years ago, okay? There's nothing new. There's nothing new there. The FDA has always been too risk averse. Now, more generally on sort of libertarianism generally, I think it's quite clear that the strongest part of our response has come from the private sector. Uh, the private sector, uh, you know, whether it be Amazon or Walmart or McDonald's, okay, um, they are really keeping this country together. And um, the, the decentralized approach, uh, letting the states, uh, letting private labs uh, come out with their own tests, that has been very, very much uh, supported. This command and control, I think, has failed, utterly failed, and a lot of people can see that now. Now, sorry, uh, so let me say, give me one more, and that's a negative one, and that is that, look, you know, I want a small government, okay? I want it much smaller than it is now, but I damn well want to get what I pay for, right? I mean, we are paying a huge chunk of our income to the government, and one of the things which I think even I, as a libertarian, think the government should do is, you know, handle pandemics and things of that nature, right? And they're failing. So they're failing to provide the public goods. You know, the whole economic reason for government is to provide public goods, and they're failing on that. So uh, I do think that pure competency, uh, you know, really matters. Um, and here, you know, the, the Trump administration, I think, is especially incompetent. It's not that, you know, other governments, lots of governments are incompetent. They're, I think, especially incompetent. And I don't want to, you know, totally go have Trump derangement syndrome. It's, it's not all Trump's fault. But just pure competency, uh, I think, really matters. And there's something about the, the U.S. which does seem, you know, when we talked earlier about how difficult it is to build a subway line. Uh, you know, how difficult it is to get anything approved. Like we could not build the Hoover Dam today, right? Uh, you know, the environmental review uh, alone. So would take years. So the, there is something which we have, we've, do seem to have become a, you know, a sclerotic uh, society. And um, I, I think pure competency and ability to get things done uh, that also matters. So that's the sense in which uh, I guess I'm sort of a little bit less libertarian or something like that. You know, when, when I want the government to act, I want it to damn well act well and competently. And that's something which uh, I'm not seeing. All right. We're going to leave it there. Alex Tabarrok of George Mason University and Marginal Revolution. Thanks for talking. Happy to be here. Hope this it's better is next time. Yeah, this has been the Reason interview with Nick Gillespie. Thanks for listening. Please subscribe to us at Reason.com.